and I'm going to start, uh, we'll pick up and start with the New Testament canon. Um, now, you remember whenever we were talking about, when we started talking about the Old Testament canon, what do we mean? The 39 books. And do you remember what time frame that, that I mentioned to you that that covers? Or, or that it was written over? It was written over a, a period of about a thousand years. Okay, now it covers more than a thousand years, but it was written over a period of about a thousand years. Different men, different. Okay, now do you remember who wrote the Old Testament? Prophets. Okay, now when you get to the New Testament, it's going to be written by apostles. Now, apostles can operate in the prophetic office. But when you get to the New Testament, the New Testament was written over about a 50-year period. And so you'll find that, that somewhere around 50, you know, and of course some of it is uh, in the late 40s, uh, that you're going to find, I believe, in fact, I believe Paul's first epistle that was written was his Galatian letter. And that was written sometime in between 45 and 49 A.D. And so then over about the next 50 years, you're going to find a variety of the rest, the Gospels, the book of Luke, uh, the Acts, and the Epistles, and then concluding with the book of Revelation that's going to be written. Now, uh, the Old Testament canon begins with the writings of the Ten Commandments. Now, I want to uh, I want to kind of give you a summary of of the canon at this point. Uh, it had to have been it had to have been written, and this is the first part. If you're taking notes on this, okay? When we talk about the canon, Old Testament or New Testament, thirty nine old, twenty seven new, is that the Old Testament or or it had to be written by a recognized prophet or apostle or by someone associated with an apostle. Now you say, well, what does that mean? Well, the book of Mark, Mark was not an apostle. Who was Mark? It was John Mark. And you remember he was one of the ones that, that Paul, uh, was in Acts 14 or 15, where that Paul got into it with Barnabas. He said, this guy is, a, is weak. He's send him home. He's a mama's boy. All right. But Mark took his dictation from Peter. So whenever you read the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, what you're reading is you are reading the words of Peter that have been given to John Mark. All right. So so we find the book of Mark. Well, he was a, he was not an apostle, but he was associated with one. Uh, Luke, he was a Gentile physician, but he was associated with an apostle. Who? Paul. And then the book of Hebrews. And I, I don't want to muddy up the water too much because uh, Brother Patterson is, you know, he's teaching that on Wednesday night. And, and some of the elders feel very strongly that the apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. There are compelling arguments for Paul having written the book of Hebrews. At the same time, there are also compelling arguments for others that have written. So what we know is that we know that there is no definitive author of the book of Hebrews. So who would write? Well, we don't know if an apostle, if Paul wrote it, then he was an apostle. But if, if somebody like Barnabas or Apollos, um, you know, if one of those people wrote it, then they would be people who were associated with uh, those apostles. And then James and Jude. Whenever we start looking at the lives of James and Jude, what we understand, of course, you know, Jude being a half-brother of the Lord. So he didn't fall in the role necessarily of being an apostle. 
But again, you realize that whenever you start looking at the canon of Scripture, that they either had to be a prophet or an apostle, or in the New Testament part, then they had to be associated with an apostle. That's point number one. Point number two is this, is it could not disagree with or contradict uh, any of the previous Scriptures. So there's times where that people, some critics of the Bible want to come along and say, well, this book or this verse contradicts this verse. Well, when you dig into them and you start, that's why we have to be diligent students. A workman, you dig in. That, that that workman has to understand that he is going to see if there is some contradiction. Oh, there's a contradiction there. There's not a contradiction. Here's a part, again, I may have mentioned in the last class. Treasure of Scripture knowledge is a cross-reference. The best way to interpret Scripture is to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Not a commentary, not an elder, not an apostle, prophet, prophetess, healer, etc. Okay? They're not the ones that's interpreting Scripture. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. And then the third thing is, is that the church had to agree and that there was a general consensus that that writing was an inspired book. Now, one of the ways that we start looking at what the early church did uh, is that whenever they came together into a body, to a corporate body to work, to, to come into a church service like we would do, what did they do? Well, by historical reference, we know what they did. They followed a very similar pattern of what they did in the synagogues. So here's what a corporate service looked like in the early church. This was the pattern. They would come in and they would have a public reading of Scripture. Somebody turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. So think about this now. They're coming together as a group and they are going to experience the public reading of Scripture. Does anybody have 1 Timothy 4.13? Sister Emily, you got it? 1 Timothy 4.13? All right, read it. Read it out. Read it loud. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Okay. You see that where he says give, exhort or give attendance to reading? What's he talking about? To the public reading of Scripture. One of the reasons that I have incorporated that here in our church, when we get up, just like we got up last night, what do we read? Matthew, Matthew chapter what? Start in verse 31 all the way down through 48. Now here's the part. In seven Sunday nights, we're going to read through the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? But now file this away in your mind. We have already read through the book of Ephesians. We've read through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. We've read through the book of Hebrews. We've read various places through Isaiah. We have read the entirety of Psalm 19. So what am I doing? I'm brainwashing this church. <laughs> <laughs> because, because what I'm do, what I'm doing is I'm getting you to the part where where that we're having the public reading of Scripture. Now some people think, oh well, that's just something that the church in Dothan does. Oh. But it's what the first century did. Right. They came together and they had the public reading of Scripture. What else did they do? Well, one of the other things that they did was they sang psalms. Hymns and spiritual songs. Where do you find that at? Colossians chapter 3. Somebody turn over to Colossians chapter 3, verses, then start in verse 16. 
Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay. So they had the public reading of Scripture. Then they had the singing of hymns. Where is the content of their singing and their hymns? The Psalms. So you have 150 pages or 150 chapters of songs that they would sing. Then what followed that? What followed that was the exposition of Scripture. What does that mean? Somebody preaching. And what they would do is they would take a text. Now I want you to turn, somebody turn to Luke chapter 4. And I want you to read uh, verses 16 through 21. And then I want somebody else to turn to Acts chapter 17. Okay, Luke chapter 4, who's got verse 16 through 21? You got it, Sister Emily? Okay, so that's, I'll tell you what, go ahead and read Acts 17 and 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and, th and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Okay, where did they do that at? Answers in verse 1, right there, that last phrase. In the synagogue of the Jews. So what did they do? The Bible says he come in, he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. You got, Brother Johnny, you got Luke? Okay, Luke chapter 4 and start in verse 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive in recovery of sight to the blind, to set, the liberty, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fast, fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bare him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceed out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Okay. So, so here, again, you get the picture? They came in. They had a public reading of scripture. There was a singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Then there was the reasoning or preaching of the scriptures. Then there was also something else. They took communion. Now they didn't do that necessarily every time that they came, but they took communion regularly. So again, you see the simplicity of the church service. Now we're building a new building right now. One of the one of the parts that our building has to have is that it has to have a sound system. And 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 it is costing an exorbitant amount of money. And so as an American, I start looking and saying, okay, the church we got to have all this stuff and we got to have all these things before we can have a church service. But when I look at what the early church did, there was a great simplicity. I would also say this, that generally speaking, you're not going to find the model of a mega church that's going to be in the book of Acts. Now, what does a mega church do? A mega church is a surrounded basically 
they surround a very charismatic individual that may be the pastor or may be the music program. And you have people flocking in and it has had its problems in, in America. And so again, when we look back and we say, are we going to let Scripture dictate the direction that we're going? And again, I'm, I know I'm chasing a rabbit a little bit, but, but here's the part that I want to get, get at. Is the canon, the New Testament letters, the 27 letters that you have, and also the 39 that you have in the Old Testament. Over time, churches would copy and circulate and collect more and more of the New Testament epistles as they could and they would be added to the worship services. By the 2nd century AD, those collections began to be secure and increasingly they were involved in having an, an acceptance among the churches and they resulted in the sharing of those texts that would be uh, those, those books that were decided, Paul's letters would make a circulation among the churches in Galatia. His letter to the church at, to the Thessalonians, his church to the Ephe his letter to the Ephesians. If there were more than one congregation that was grouped around, now history tells us that the congregation in uh, Ephesus reached somewhere between thirty and as much as fifty thousand people. But they were not all grouped up in one big group of fifty thousand people but scattered around into small churches throughout the area, what was taking place? Those letters that Paul, that letter that Paul wrote was being passed around. And what they would do is they would let somebody say, okay, your job is, is you got to write down and copy this letter and pass it around so that somebody can, can read this particular letter. Now, the Chinese church, and I'll end with this, the church in China, I have a friend of mine that works with a parachurch organization. It's not apostolic, but they do go over and they um, supply Bibles uh, to, to those, those churches. And uh, he told me that what some of these people do is they don't even have a full Bible. It's what they'll have is they'll have... They'll have people that will write down different books and what they'll do is they'll pass that book along to somebody else in the house church movement over in China. And he, he told me, he said that y'all y'all seen the Dollar Tree Bibles? You, have you ever bought one from the Dollar Tree? Those, those Bibles in the Dollar Tree are, I mean, they're, they're just they're, they're just a cheap, cheap paperback. Uh, this friend of mine went into China. They met at a restaurant. And whenever they walked in the restaurant, he had on a trench coat. And inside of that trench coat, in all the pockets, it was cold weather. But in all, they, it was designed where it had pockets in the front and in the back. He said they could get somewhere around 50 Bibles that was inside of that trench coat. And he said they walked in the restaurant and they sat down. And he says it's kind of awkward sitting down because you're sitting on Bibles. Uh, but he said that, you know, the meal started. And he said what they started doing was they were just like they were milling around in the restaurant. And he said they would take these Bibles out and they would hand those Bibles to these people. And as soon as these people would get these Bibles, they would shove them down into a bag or a purse. Or some of them would put them down into their, their clothing. But he said they, these people were literally crying because some of them had never had a Bible in their entire life. Now you compare that to the way we treat the Bible. And, and that's concerning to me. So, well despite my best intentions, we did chase some rabbits tonight. And, uh, but anyways, we'll try to get back on track next uh, Monday night. And um